Morning, everyone, my fellow Americans. Glad you could all tune in before tonight's State of the Union address, and won't mind missing the first half hour or so. I'm sure you can watch it online later, as you could watch this farminar. Anyway, welcome to tonight's Practical Farmers of Iowa farminar, Scale and Profitability, the Right Fit for Two Vegetable Farms. Joining us tonight are Dan uh, Gunther and Mike Reset. Um, Dan is an outspoken advocate for small-scale sustainable farming. Along with his family, he owns and operates Common Harvest Farm in Osceola, Wisconsin, and he's been doing this for 25 years. And Mike uh, has been farming since 1992, running a 145-member CSA at Spring Hill Community Farm near Prairie Farm, Wisconsin, east of the Twin Cities. Uh, he farms with his wife, Patty, and their three children. Um, and before we get to Dan and Mike, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. Most of you are probably familiar, but <clears throat> in case we've got any new folks in the audience, we have a winter farm at our series, which is what you are attending tonight. This is the second of the series, and they're all free. They're all on Tuesday at 7 o'clock to 8.30, and if you miss one, you can get them online later. Uh, Practical Farmers was founded in 1985 by a group of farmers who were interested in doing their own on-farm research and sharing that knowledge with each other. We're still farmer-led and a member-driven nonprofit based in Ames, Iowa, and our mission is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. We work with a huge diversity of farms from uh, conventional row crop farmers and livestock to uh, diverse organic horticultural production, and we also have friends of farmer members. So everybody's welcome, and we really encourage collaboration and learning from different perspectives. Uh, if you want to join Practical Farmers of Iowa, you get some great benefits, such as having our newsletter, The Practical Farmer, delivered to your house. Um, you also get a great discount at our annual conference, which is coming up this week. And it's pretty inexpensive, $60 for your whole, your whole farm. So if you are a member as a whole farm, uh, you and your whole family and your farm employees can come to our conference for one admission. Um, it's a really great benefit of, of all being involved. So uh, look, check out the website to apply or to register for the conference this year. I'll, it's all walk-ins at this point, but we'd love to see you there. Uh, it's in Ames on Friday and Saturday. Uh, you can check our events calendar on the web page. We have all of our events listed there, as well as events from other agricultural organizations that you might find of interest. So definitely use that as a resource. And I was sort of plugging our conference just now, and this is, again, the front cover of our brochure, Mapping Our Future. Uh, you should definitely come and check that out or check out the uh, website afterward, and we'll have some of the conference sessions recorded on there as well. Uh, there are a few rules to the Farminar. You probably noticed that if you are a participant in this Farminar, your microphone is inactive. And that keeps the noise down, the background noise and the, uh, the reverb. So you'll be able to ask questions in the chat box at any time. We will reserve the last 30 minutes to answer questions, unless Dan and Mike see one and they think, I'm going to talk about that right now. They might jump in there. Um, but the last 30 minutes for questions. Um, and that's really the only rule there is. Um, so with that, I think we're loading up the next presentation, and I will turn it over to Dan and Mike. Well, this is Mike. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa for inviting Dan and I to uh, participate. Uh, we have both been big believers in the peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer uh, exchange, and we really like this model. It's a very uh, uh, humbling uh, and honorable experience for uh, us to uh, uh, work with you tonight. And it's also, uh, I always enjoy working with Dan. He has been uh, a great mentor to me and to our family and our farm. He's uh, certainly one of the great voices in the CSA movement uh, in the United States. What we hope to talk about tonight is sharing a little bit about uh, how we have gone about uh, our thinking relative to building the capital infrastructure of our farms over the last 20 years. So after a little bit of an introduction to each one of our farms, we will take a look at uh, uh, some of the things to consider about uh, capitalizing your farm, aspects on where to source capital, and then finally ending with uh, a few of the specifics relative to scale. So the focus, in other words, will be on uh, the first five years of a market farm, capitalizing. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dan. Hello, this is Dan. I just want to echo uh, Mike's um, 
sentiments and comments here that it's a real pleasure to be with all of you and uh, this is a new experience for me personally so uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, Steve's help and it's been a real joy working with the Practical Farmers of Iowa and we're just really glad to uh, have this experience and uh, uh, Mike and I have done a number of workshops together over the years uh, he always gives me way more credit than I deserve uh, so uh, keep that in mind um, but uh, we do work well together and one of the things that's been interesting about our particular farms is that we've sort of defied some of the uh, assumptions around scale and uh, we have found uh, maybe call it our sweet spot or something but our farms have been fairly stable for quite a few years uh, in our case our farm membership has been the same now for about 17 or 18 years and uh, that uh, that in and of itself says something about having systems in place uh, that, that, that seem to be working and uh, I guess that's some of what we're hoping to share with you tonight. So I'm going to start by introducing our farm uh, and then Mike will, uh, will continue with uh, his, uh, uh, I see Mike just breezed over this photo. This is Mike and myself here. Uh, I guess I'm we're trying to figure out who's who, but uh, I guess I'm driving the tractor and Mike's on the planter here. But uh, uh, So the name of our farm, Common Harvest Farm, it started in the fall of 1989. Uh, we were uh, involved in a peace and justice community in the, in the Twin Cities. And uh, the f a number of the members of this community were expressing some interest in being connected to a piece of land and uh, we started conversations and one thing led to another and uh, we, uh, with the help and support of uh, this community, we were able to find, uh, find some land and start farming. A um, Couple things, I, I did do an internship in uh, 89 and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and how that in internship uh, factored into some of my own um, decision making process uh, uh, like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, within the first eight years of our farm, we moved four times. So we were a bit uh, nomadic uh, in the early years of our farm and uh, it wasn't until um, uh, 1997 that we purchased a farm and then moved uh, to the farm where we are now in 1998. So. Um, a couple interesting things about those uh, early years. Uh, my wife, uh, Margaret, uh, was teaching at the time. She enjoyed her teaching job and uh, we had uh, good benefits through that job. And uh, she was teaching uh, English as a second language. And uh, so we were able to, uh, that, that's a very important uh, uh, starting point because our household income, our household needs were uh, satisfied uh, through Margaret's income and so for approximately the first four years we were able to put all of uh, the returns from the farm back into capitalizing the business and I know that that is not the case for everyone. Um, we were fortunate in that at the time when Margaret decided to, to leave her job that the farm, that we had the capital and the markets in place for the farm to immediately begin to pay ourselves a wage. Uh, you know, we still struggled with health insurance and a few other things. Um, but uh, so uh, that's something that, uh, you know, was kind of maybe unique to our farm um, during that. So. I mentioned that we moved four different times. Uh, the thing that was interesting is when we moved, we, we moved an established business. So we moved our equipment and we, uh, we had some temporary structures, uh, uh, kind of a harvest tent and uh, we did have a, a walk-in cooler and other things that we did uh, end up uh, relocating. And uh, so uh, we were able to I should just mention that one of the reasons we moved is that we really did uh, want to farm as close to the urban core as possible. This was back before urban agriculture had really taken a hold and uh, so we were farming uh, in the kind of uh, 
uh, second ring suburbs and there was a lot of development pressure and uh, as a result of that we ended up uh, being uh, displaced and, and moving a little bit. So I'll kind of walk you through some slides here now, images of our farm. Um, so uh, we, the, the farm is a former dairy farm. Uh, nobody had lived on the farm since 1962 and uh, there was a nice collection of, of small buildings. Uh, there was no paint on any buildings, no panes of glass left in any uh, of the buildings. Uh, as I said, nobody had lived here for 37 years. So the farm was pretty close to, to, to be, uh, being beyond repair, but we were able to um, put uh, new roofs on a few buildings and decide which buildings to, uh, to keep and invest in and which buildings to take down. We did take down two buildings when we moved here and uh, we've been in the process of sort of building the farm up from there. Uh, this building here, um, we do have a, a classroom uh, on the farm, and uh, so this is a, um, we do have a, uh, if I can figure out how to use this, there's at the end of this building, there's a kitchen uh, for our workers. Uh, our, we do uh, rely uh, primarily upon interns and then also some hourly workers. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, we have a walk-in cooler, I mean, excuse me, a root cellar underneath this building. And then this uh, two-thirds, eastern two-thirds of this building is a, uh, is a meeting room or a classroom on our farm, which has been a very valuable part of our business. Um, this is an aerial photo of our, our farm taken in 1999. Uh, you can kind of get a feel for uh, the lay of the land a little bit. Uh, we have two to four percent slopes. Uh, we're located only a half a mile uh, from the St. Croix River, which is just to the west. We have a combination of, um, if you look at uh, the, I'm trying to drag that arrow, um, Roughly the, 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 the northwestern half of the farm um, is characterized by sandy soils. So I'll draw a line here. We have lighter ground to the north and, and heavier ground. You can see this is kind of a wet complex here. We have some drainage down through here. So uh, we tend to get into this the ground up here a little bit earlier. Uh, the difficulty with that is it does dry out later in the season. Uh, this ground is a bit heavier down here, but then does weather those drought cycles uh, much better. Um, the dark uh, patch in the middle here was about uh, three quarters of an acre of raspberries that we had for about five or six years. Uh, this is a bit of a sketch then of the lay of the fields. Uh, our row lengths are, uh, we have a few fields uh, that are uh, back in this back in this area here that are um, in the 400 foot range. But uh, for the most part, the fields are, I would say our average uh, row length is about 275 feet. And that does come into play uh, when we start describing the different equipment that we're using, uh, in particular the use of hand tools and stuff. We have built a number of new buildings on our farm. This was a machine shed that we built in 2012. Um, we did take down, uh, together with a friend, I took down five buildings on a neighboring farm and used as much salvage material as possible. And we can talk more about that if you're interested in just how to save money and how to be thrifty about things. Uh, that's been a kind of an important part of our expansion. Uh, being a CSA, inviting people to the farm is a really uh, fundamental part of what we do and making people feel welcome and, uh, you know, part of the, uh, the whole uh, relationship building of what makes a, a farm work. And uh, part of that, uh, we built a, an outdoor wood-fired pizza oven in 2003 and we do have a number of, of gather typically an annual uh, gathering on our farm. Uh, that involves uh, kind of a build your own pizza. Uh, we do host other groups here. Uh, farm members have uh, used the space that I showed you earlier and the brick oven for different events and stuff. So that's something that's added a lot of uh, a lot to our farm. So again, we have 40 acres uh, of which about uh, 15 is tillable. We have about 10 to 11 in vegetables at any given time and probably 
three or four acres in uh, cover crops and uh, uh, fallow cycle and other things. So uh, at, that, at this point, I'll turn it over to Mike and uh, we can. Thank you, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, our farm and the history. So uh, Patty and I, uh, we started Spring Hill Community Farm in 1992. We heard a story on uh, uh, public radio about this uh, notion of uh, community supported agriculture and uh, we looked at each other and said, wow, maybe we could do that. And so we went to uh, some family and friends, uh, folks we knew that uh, they wouldn't reject us if we failed miserably. Uh, and so we started out with about 18 households, uh, many of whom are still with us today. But when we came to the CSA idea, we came uh, to this out of a uh, uh, community organizing and uh, uh, social movement perspective and uh, started building our CSA uh, farm membership around those common ideas of uh, land stewardship and uh, uh, food justice. Uh, so that was a big part of where we started and it's still a big, big part of what we do today. So we have about five acres of vegetables, 150 members give or take. Uh, and uh, we have three adult children, um, uh, one of whom works uh, uh, in, in the summer, but the other two are off uh, doing other things. And Patty and I combine for about uh, a one full-time equivalency between the two of us. And then we also hire another uh, approximately 1,000 hours of labor to help run the farm. And our goal has been very simple right from the start. It's to eventually make a full-time living on the farm. And much like uh, uh, Margaret and Dan, our first five years uh, we provided uh, working capital uh, and background capital from an off-farm uh, job. I was a teacher at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I saw a little, uh, our, um, so my children, my family, um, and as I said, most of those guys are off doing other things right now, but they do come back and help out uh, quite a bit, so that's fun. So our farm is about five acres. It sits in a uh, valley. Uh, here you get a, a good sense of, uh, of our farm. Uh, some of the strengths of our farm, and I will attempt to draw this in the way that Dan has. Uh, we have, um, it's, it's nicely sheltered. Uh, so we don't have to contend with uh, a drift or uh, other agricultural enterprises impacting us. And it's quite private. You know, we're at the end of a dead-end road. Uh, and uh, although this aerial view doesn't do it justice, there is about 150 uh, foot elevation difference between the ridge and the hillside. So this is a frost pocket. We've learned to deal with that but there's some really nice soils and uh, that's kind of the trade-off. You'll notice that we have slight curves to our fields uh, and that's because we've laid out contours because of the sloping hills. We've learned to uh, mitigate erosion and we'll talk about that a little bit later on how some of the land and its needs has driven our uh, infrastructure and investments. Uh, a big focus of our farm has been on the community piece of CSA. Uh, we have um, been very, very uh, fortunate to have a very high return rate over the years and uh, uh, from our surveys, from our informal conversations and uh, from our observations, it seems that a big, big part of our success has been the fact that we have invested a lot into the community side of our farm. And I'll talk about our delivery system a little bit later in terms of infrastructure. So one of the questions that new farms often begin in terms of uh, investments is where to start. So both uh, Margaret and Dan and Patty and I have uh, started with this idea of number one you need to have some goals. Where do you want to be a year from now? Where do you want to be five years from now? Where do you want to be ten years from now? And on our particular farm, since we're a CSA exclusively, we have done this in the context of our farm membership. So we have an advisory board, a core group, and that core group has uh, 
served as an advisory board, a sounding board, uh, a board of critique at times to say, help us uh, create these goals. So uh, over the years, we have had very specific goals around infrastructure. We've had also more uh, softer goals, if you will, around building membership. But in all cases, uh, having a destination in mind has really helped us uh, uh, build our farm. So uh, in addition to having goals, then we've tried to put a system into place. And Dan is one of the first people that I really started to understand uh, the concept of systems. Uh, and so Dan would talk about how he would integrate uh, his different tractors or his uh, planting schemes so that he has remarkable efficiency uh, with a uh, limited pool of capital that most of us are working with. And then finally, in your big, uh, where to begin idea, uh, we do a resource assessment. So one of the ways to think about this is what is available in your community? Uh, so for example, when we started our farm in 92, uh, we had a uh, neighbor who is uh, a semi-retired farmer, fantastic uh, mentor to me, and uh, one of the things he said was, now don't go and buy all of this equipment right away, but you might consider matching your equipment to things that I have. And so he was willing to uh, uh, barter the use of his equipment, um, and that was a resource that we did not have to purchase right away. So thing, for example, we uh, had a tractor of very similar size to what uh, he did, and we were able to then use his plow, his disc, his mower, etc. Uh, <clears throat> another resource assessment that has, uh, in terms of infrastructure, that we have uh, taken advantage of over the years is there's other CSA growers in our community, and we've shared resources so that we can all either make better use of our capital or uh, just entirely uh, avoid purchasing something that uh, is really going to be redundant, only used once or twice a year. Um, so Dan, I'm not sure if you would like to talk about goals and systems at this point, or do you want to go on to the next one? Now, I've got a few things I'd like to share here, and uh, I guess what I'd like to uh, start with is just some kind of some overarching uh, kind of philosophical approaches to uh, some of these questions about capitalization. And, uh, you know, I was thinking uh, in preparation for this that if you were to visit our farm, uh, one of the things that you would notice, our, 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 both of our farms, Mike and, and myself here, that one of the things you would notice is that we do not have a lot of extra equipment sitting around. And uh, both my parents grew up in farming. Uh, one of the... Um, both of them grew up on, on kind of small size ranches in Montana, and uh, it was uh, both of those farms barely survived the uh, crisis of the 80s, and, uh, they, but they did survive it with a lot of debt. And uh, I do remember at the time uh, in the late 70s a, a tremendous amount of uh, growth and capitalization taking place on those farms. And at the time, I was young enough that I didn't really understand what was taking place, but uh, this whole notion of trying to keep up, uh, get bigger, get out, and, and all of that. So, you know, that, that historical piece sort of comes into play. Uh, but as I mentioned, Mike and I both uh, do not have a lot of equipment sitting around. We don't have a grove of, <laughs> of uh, spare, spare uh, uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, we might have a few things. Um, and this fits within a larger philosophical context. Um, uh, one thing is I'm not very mechanical. And, uh, and at first I used to see that as a real uh, detriment. Uh, in fact, I had even considered uh, possibly not even farming because I had equated uh, so much of farming with, uh, with uh, mechanization that I thought, how, can I, how exactly can I do this? And uh, I think after 25 years of farming, I'm starting to realize that uh, not being uh, mechanical has actually been, uh, there have been some advantages to that. Um, one of the things, um, uh, a, a couple, uh, I'll offer here three sort of, uh, sort of foundational um, uh, things that I've heard uh, over the years. Uh, one was a Joel is a Joel Salatin quote, and he said, uh, "You know, if we're going to advance agriculture in this country, 
we need to find biological solutions rather than technological solutions to biological problems. And I think the temptation is to think that there's some quick fix, that there's some tool that's going to make life a lot easier. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely a student of, of, of observation and, and trying to figure, figure something out, to really try and train my eye to try and figure out what exactly I'm seeing and experiencing and, and not being quick to, uh, to jump at some uh, uh, solution, uh, some new purchase that, that might uh, be seen as a solution to that. Along with that is something I heard uh, on a trip I took to Cuba in 1996 where uh, a farmer said that uh, the, the future of agriculture is hinges upon our ability as farmers to substitute ideas for inputs. And uh, that's something that's always been a little bit of a mantra of mine is that uh, uh, using my mind uh, to the fullest extent and uh, questioning uh, purchased inputs and uh, you know some of the capital um, uh, mechanization and capital requirements uh, that I had uh, thought was necessary. Uh, the third thing would be uh, something that I heard a farmer say, similar maybe to what Mike uh, referred to, and that is uh, an old timer said to me early on, he said, uh, don't uh, succumb to shiny paint disease, which he said is the, uh, the, the demise uh, of many farmers. And uh, those were some choice words of wisdom that um, I have um, uh, carried with me to this day. And you know, it's, it's, I'm sort of struck with, uh, we live in a consumer society and, and uh, we carry around all of these uh, somewhat false assumptions that purchasing something new is going to be the answer to solving our problems. And uh, so, as I mentioned, that, you know, we've tried to be uh, careful and mindful and, uh, so, you know, it's been great having uh, Mike as a, as a, 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 you know, a counterpart to talk things over with and, uh, uh, this community of uh, community of farms, uh, community of farmers, I think, is a really val valuable thing. Um, as Mike mentioned, uh, this systems approach is something that's been uh, essential to some of my thinking around farming, and uh, I have seen on many occasions. Um, uh, and I should just mention that uh, uh, over the years, as we've been speaking with different groups, uh, one of the things that we have discovered is that. Years uh, four, five, and six are some of the most critical years in uh, market gardening. Um, and uh, one of the things that we see is that um, uh, your first couple of years, you're, you're sort of flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, everything, you know, you sort of uh, gloss over some of the challenges and think, wow, this is great. I'm doing pretty well. I've, I've sold this much. Uh, there's a lot of potential, a lot of excitement. Your enthusiasm sort of carries you. But what we find is that in years four, five, and six, if these systems don't develop to sustain uh, your livelihood and uh, to, to create some efficiencies within your farm, uh, that it becomes uh, very difficult to sort of maintain that same degree of uh, enthusiasm when you start. So um, we can talk a little bit more about what some of these systems are, but just a couple things, uh, making sure that uh, implements are compatible with different pieces of equipment, um, making sure that your row spacing is, is very defined um, and that uh, all of your cultivators, for example, are set up and do not require a lot of adjustment. Um, uh, you know, having uh, efficiencies in mind in, in post-harvest handling and your, your, your uh, harvest, uh, yeah, harvest shed, uh, walk-in cooler, uh, everything from how you're handling uh, things to how you're loading and, and delivering. So a lot of time and effort has gone into sort of streamlining and uh, making sure that we're not uh, double handling uh, stuff as much as possible. So. Um, I'm going to turn this back to you, Mike, and we can uh, flip this to the next uh, slide here. So go ahead. Thank you, Dan. Uh, one of the things that uh, we'd like to point out is that uh, farming, whether it's large scale, small scale, somewhere in between, 
uh, has to have capital. It's just like any other business. So capital is required to start the farm. There's no way around that, and you can go about that in many different ways. But it is something that I think all farms need to recognize. So traditional sources of uh, capital, off-farm income, that's what we did. That's what Margaret Dan did, that's quite common. Uh, loans, FSA, has a lot of nice options for new and beginning farmers now. And also plowing some of your annual farm budget profits, if uh, there are any, back into your farm operation, as Dan mentioned that he and Margaret did for the first five years. There is, of course, uh, non-traditional sources, uh, gifts, donation, private loans. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Margaret and Dan have done, and Dan, perhaps you can talk about this in a moment, is uh, you have a version of shares that you have sold over the years that are uh, longer term that have provided some operating and working capital uh, for you over those years. Yeah, um, so uh, this would be now under non-traditional sources, um, and, and I should just mention that uh, you know, I think the temptation for all of us is to uh, follow the conventional thinking. And uh, one of the things that I've been struck by here recently is these uh, low-interest FSA loans and uh, how enticing they are, uh, even at uh, one and a half to three percent, or or what uh, uh, you know, whatever some of those are. And those really weren't available to us at the time, and so we had to be creative. But but a but a byproduct of that creativity was developing community and lasting long-term relationships with people. We, we gave people an opportunity to invest in the farm. Uh, so what Mike is referring to under a non-traditional source here is that on uh, three different occasions, we have sold uh, seven-year shares. And what that essentially involves is taking uh, this sh a given year's uh, share price and uh, uh, extrapolating that out over this seven-year uh, period, and folks would then make a seven, a, a one-time seven-year payment, um, and then as the share price increases over that seven-year period, which on average it's been increasing, say about 15%, uh, that ends up coming back to uh, those investors as a uh, uh, as a return on on that investment, and uh, so a few things that we've done: we uh, built and uh, we 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 dug a new well, uh, drilled a new well. We put up a harvest shed with, uh, and I should say that we we kind of limit the number to around ten at any given time. Uh, and you really have to be careful because you have to carry that essentially as debt then, uh, because you're not going to have that income coming in uh, for, uh, in our case, about. Uh, you know, 5% uh, of our shares then over a six-year period. We do not have that as, a, as an annual source of income. Uh, we used it to build a new barn. Uh, we've also uh, used it to uh, uh, purchase a, a, a greenhouse, and uh, we had an opportunity to buy about 200 tons of compost a few years ago, and our members helped us with that, and we did that with these long-term uh, long shares. I should also mention that when we purchased our farm, um, we had more than 60 people donate to the farm. And uh, some of those donations were in-kind donations. Uh, f folks gave us all manner of things. Uh, we built a house, and uh, people were very instrumental in that. Uh, but we have also been uh, the uh, beneficiaries of a tremendous amount of goodwill. and. Uh, uh, support from a very dedicated group of people. And so we were able to generate about $60,000, and that allowed us to, to take that money to the bank. I should also mention that we sold a conservation easement on our farm, uh, and essentially our members bought that conservation easement, so they were the ones that took the tax credit for that. And uh, that's essentially how we structured that $60,000. We also have an equity share arrangement where our members are able, our, our members have been able to purchase uh, up to 15% of the appraised value of our farm, and that comes to us directly as investment capital. And I can answer uh, specific questions about this uh, uh, over the coming days if, if folks uh, have specific questions about some of these investment tools. But 
Uh, essentially what we've done is we've worked with a land trust uh, that in the event that our farm sells, it will sell for 15% below the market value to a beginning farmer. Uh, those are our wishes and that's part of a covenant that we have. And our farm members then have purchased that 15% and that's given us some additional capital. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'm uh, in this slide right here, Dan, uh, um, if you can, we'll put you right back on, but this is uh, a very uh, interesting illustration of how uh, your capital seems to work for you over time. One of the things that's sort of a, uh, uh, you know, s sort of an assumption, I think, uh, at least it was for me, is that a dollar in would be a dollar out, and that uh, uh, we would, if, if we invested in something, we would see an immediate return uh, on that investment. And uh, the more I started to observe uh, how we were making uh, capital in investments on our farm, I began to think about them more in terms of a stair step, uh, as is illustrated on the right-hand side of this slide. And so if you take the, uh, if, if you take the, uh, uh, the tread, if you will, the flat part of the stair here, uh, we're making investments, um, and those investments take a while to fit within the system. So uh, there may be uh, it taking time to, to, to incorporate them into the efficiency of the farm. Maybe it's a new piece of equipment that's taken some tinkering and adjusting, and, and maybe it doesn't really fit for a year or two. Um, so what I have uh, observed uh, with our farm in terms of capitalization is that the most profitable point of the, f of the farm is at the top of the riser. And uh, I don't know if this illustration is necessarily uh, all that helpful, but I guess what I wanted to leave you with is this idea that uh, when we do invest, it oftentimes will take time in order to really uh, see the return on those investments. And so what we tend to do is sort of invest, um, we are doing uh, some minimal annual investments, but we tend to do uh, sort of larger investments every three to five years, for example, and then we let things sort of settle in a little bit and, and uh, incorporate those into the system. I should also mention that uh, somewhat by accident, I uh, ended up discovering early on in the history of our farm that we were much better able to incorporate a new tool in the mid part of the season or in the fall than we were in the spring. So here you are in the spring, you hit, your, you hit the ground with your feet running, uh, you know, everything is coming at you and you have a new tool and, and you're all excited about it and this is gonna be the answer to all your challenges uh, and questions, but um, it's, it's very hard to dedicate the time to a new cultivator or a new, uh, a new piece of equipment to really get it up and, and functioning properly. And so uh, somewhat by accident, I, I once bought a, a a fairly complicated cultivator with lots of adjustments, and I bought it in July. Um, f I think the the manufacturer didn't have uh, any available to ship in the spring, and they said they'd have it to me in July. And all of a sudden, I discovered that our fall brassicas provided me an excellent opportunity to really have the time to fine tune it and get it up to speed so that next spring uh, it was up and going. And so uh, this riser, uh, kind of represents that uh, lag time, if you will, from a purchase to reaching uh, maximum efficiency with that uh, tool. So go ahead. Uh, sometimes my lag time seems to be about 10 years, but I'm still learning. So, um, so one of the things we want to talk about is what do you buy first when you think about if you're going to start on your farm, uh, what's some of the first things that you absolutely need? Um, so some of the essentials in any small market farm, you can have a need a way to start seeds, you have to have a power source, 
and some tillage. There's direct seeding needs, equipment, cultivation, harvesting, post-harvest handling, and a delivery system. Uh, notice that there's not much in the way of uh, mentioning of your annual costs such as uh, uh, marketing, etc. These are just the essentials in terms of infrastructure. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, table right here gives you an idea of uh, um, what common uh, essentials are at different scales. So for example, if you're on the one to three, um, your seed starting needs might be taken care of with a small hoop house, grow lights, planting trays in the house, and you'll uh, get along just fine. Um, I, in the handouts uh, under the notes that uh, uh, Steve has put together, I did include something uh, uh, entitled the Market Grower Business Chronology. This is something I uh, prepared for the Wisconsin School for Beginning Market Growers. And in that, uh, I have illustrated uh, what we purchased in year one, uh, what we had in place at year five, year 10, 15, etc. So if you want to take a look at that sometime, uh, you'll see how this uh, rolled out on our particular farm. Uh, if you increase in size to four to six acres, notice you're going to see things uh, such as becoming much more important, such as a cultivating tractor or a potato digger, uh, a cargo van for delivery. Um, for you, if you're doing a CSA, then uh, your roller tracks for conveyors, hand carts, all of these things become profoundly important because you're moving literally tons and tons of produce through your farm in a given season. And even on a four to six acre, that will uh, save you in the long run, not only financially uh, and time, but also wear and tear on your body. Uh, so a, a couple of visuals about starting on the seed starting aspect, uh, one to three acres. Uh, when we first started, we had a very simple hoop house, <clears throat> and it was not big. It was a single layer of poly. Uh, we contracted out our very early things and then used this as primarily as a way to grow some of our early crops. Uh, there were many years where we also started onions, uh, uh, thousands of onions in our bedroom at any given time in the month of March. Uh, later on, uh, you might choose to add a greenhouse. Uh, and this is our greenhouse, a thousand square foot, does five acres quite comfortably. We've also added uh, field tunnels uh, just for growing in season. But uh, if need be, the field tunnels uh, uh, can be used um, work right here. Uh, they can be used as an overflow um, uh, for hardening off out of the greenhouse if we don't have things planted in there yet. Uh, on your power source and your tillage under one to three acres, really common to have a single rototiller. Uh, Troy Belt is a common brand. Uh, and then a small tractor, either with a plow. This is the kind of thing you can have a neighbor do. Um, if you're in the vicinity of somebody who's willing to do a little bit of custom work. Uh, later on, you might, uh, on a four to six acre, get into a 30 to 50 horsepower tractor. Uh, this is a tractor that we added uh, probably in about year 18. So this is relatively new. Uh, one thing I want to point out specifically is uh, with, you'll notice at the, uh, I'm struggling with my pointer here, so forgive me. All right, uh, the transplanter here, the water wheel transplanter, we were not able to use a transplanter of any significance until we actually purchased a tractor that had a hydrostatic transmission. That allows us to go slow enough in order to transplant. So if you're going to save time by transplanting mechanically, this is where uh, this is an example of that systems idea uh, where you have your tractor and your transplanter are working in sync. Um, tillers and spaders are very nice primary tillage options. Uh, there's many different kinds of spaders. You're, you'll see here on the left a uh, uh, spader that has a lot of moving parts. Um, they do a fantastic job, but um, as Dan mentioned earlier, unless you're mechanically inclined, uh, they may not be necessarily the best fit for you. 
Tillers, of course, are ubiquitous and easy to overuse. One has to be careful, but notice that right here, the tiller width is the same as the outside tractor tires, and this uh, plays into the system. So, for example, you can do a single bed without disturbing uh, any of the plantings next to you. Uh, other tillage tools, discs and diggers, uh, and uh, the newer discs, notice, will have uh, a uh, flexible option. This can be uh, pulled to be more aggressive or less aggressive. Uh, diggers are nice tools for, uh, particularly when you're starting out, they're very effective at removing quack rhizomes. Uh, and um, then you'll also need, once you have your ground worked, you'll need to have some sort of direct seeding apparatus. And uh, Dan, this is a particular photograph of Dan's uh, uh, carrot seeder, primarily. And I'd like uh, Dan to talk about that, if he would, just a little bit. I think this carrot seeder uh, represents uh, one of the decisions that we made that really did move our business ahead. Um, is a Stan Hay belt seeder. Uh, at the time, it was $1,500, which seemed like a tremendous amount of money for, uh, you know, compared to a Planet Junior for $75. Or the, excuse me, the Planet Junior, I paid $50 at an auction. That is the uh, steel uh, hopper one behind here. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, Earthway seeder in the front, all three of these we still have and, and use. But the the Stan Hay allowed us to uh, plant carrots in such a manner that we had uh, uh, no need for thinning. And then ended up being a very significant uh, labor saving uh, step for us and uh, resulted in us having uh, really for the first time, uh, we purchased it in 1996 and uh, still have it today. It's, it's very well made. Um, and uh, so uh, th that's just one example. And I guess while I'm uh, speaking, I, I just wanted to maybe step back a, a little bit and, and, and add a few things in terms of my own uh, way of, of prioritizing purchases. And uh, <coughs> for me, there, it comes down to uh, sort, of a, 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 a sort of a quick list that I have here. Uh, certainly cost is a consideration. Uh, do we purchase it new? Is it available, uh, used? Um, here, here's sort of a, uh, an important thing for me. Can I repair it myself? Um, are parts readily available? Uh, what is the resale value of, of a tool? Um, do I want it or need it? Uh, that's taken me time to, to really get my mind around. Um, it's like I mentioned, it's just all too easy to think, uh, you know, this tool would really advance things and oftentimes uh, it doesn't. So can I uh, co-own it uh, with a neighbor? Uh, that is uh, certainly one of the historical uh, questions in agriculture in this country. I look at the number of uh, uh, hay balers on neighboring dairy farms and uh, <laughs> it's such a curious thing that uh, we all end up needing things at, at roughly the same time. Uh, I should mention that the carrot seeder uh, pictured here, uh, I do share that with uh, a number of other farms and uh, uh, in exchange for that they do uh, barter, trade, loan other things and that's been a really good uh, cooperative relationships. So what is the expected life of a tool? This, uh, once again, this Stan Hay Cedar, I've, we've owned it for now uh, uh, 16, 17 years, and we've made absolutely no changes to it. It's very well made, uh, so the durability of something that you purchase is a very high consideration. Um, uh, it's something that Mike mentioned, how many moving parts does it have? Um, and uh, you know, that, that's something that's come into play a number of times. Uh, I'm personally not a big fan of PTO implements, uh, partly because of damaging soil structure, um, but they are, um, you know, oftentimes part of the equation in market gardening. And uh, so I, I also wanted to mention that it's, it's, it's interesting that when we started farming, uh, in terms of prioritizing our purchases, uh, this is kind of hard for beginning farmers today to really uh, uh, understand, but uh, we did not have a walk-in cooler or any ref uh, any uh, uh, irrigation for the first four years that we that we farmed. And uh, I know that climate change is something that's on uh, most of our minds, and uh, certainly the variabilities with regards to drought and it's too much or too little is oftentimes the unfortunate uh, situation for us. But 
uh, you know, just to give you an idea that in 1990, when we started farming, irrigation was uh, much lower on the priority list. And now, um, I would think that uh, if you were starting today, I would think that irrigation, both irrigation uh, and refrigeration would have to be much higher on the uh, priority list to purchase. I completely agree with Dan. Uh, we did not start with much irrigation, nor did we start with a walk-in cooler. We were able to rent walk-in cooler space from a neighbor, neighbor about two miles away for a number of years. However, uh, as Dan said, um, I would strongly suggest that uh, you consider irrigation and post-harvest handling in the form of a cool walk-in cooler and a vegetable prep area as primary importance. Uh, particularly uh, as uh, GAP standards and the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act will come into play and affect many of us. Uh, going uh, back to some of the equipment on a, on a larger scale, on the five to six acre range, you'll see other primary tillage implements. Uh, one of the things that Dan mentioned is not being a fan of uh, tillage tools that uh, disrupt the soil. Uh, by destroying the aggregate quality. Uh, Dan uh, has a uh, key line plow, which you see in the upper right hand corner. It's a fantastic tool for uh, subsoiling. Dan can talk about that in a little bit. Um, other equipment you might want to consider is a smaller backpack sprayer or a three point or a three point tractor sprayer. Um, if you use either one of these, it's always important, organic or conventional, to always calibrate your equipment so that you know what you're putting on. Uh, more is not always better. And then uh, various methods of transplanting. Uh, we have the, the old uh, one row transplanter, horse drawn originally, uh, often called tobacco transplanters because they were found on those farms. Uh, lower right hand corner is more of a conventional transplanter. And then on the upper right hand corner, you'll see a water wheel. And this is an implement I mentioned earlier. We use this uh, a lot uh, on our farm. Uh, irrigation, uh, Dan stressed the importance of irrigation. If you're going to grow vegetables today, you have to have irrigation. That's just a fact. And uh, there's several different systems. Drip systems are your most uh, inexpensive and most efficient use of water. They are a little more labor intensive and you do have uh, disposable items in the form of the tubing. Uh, some People have uh, solid set irrigation lines with aluminum pipe and sprinklers. And if you have enough water capacity, you can also run uh, the traveling guns. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a spring-fed pond, and so we use surface irrigation water in the form of the sprinkler heads. Uh, cultivation. On the smaller scale, lots of wheel hose and hand hose. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, doing this. Uh, a tying weeder is a very effective tool. Uh, we have one. It's one of the things I've not yet sold, although I use it only about every three to four years because conditions have to be just right. But on those years uh, when the conditions are right, in other words, uh, drier soil in the spring, this is a remarkable tool and uh, it does pay for itself. Three-point cultivators. Uh, and those are fairly common and standard. And then uh, there's the cultivating tractors. And uh, uh, I've had a Farmall A uh, and I had an Alice G. But uh, after Dan talks about his G, I will tell you why we no longer uh, have cultivating tractors. And this is a picture of Dan's G that he has retrofitted in a very fun way. So we purchased a, an Alice Chalmers G in 1994 for $500, believe it or not, and um, the, uh, we ended up uh, converting it to electric uh, two years ago, and uh, I would have to say that this tractor has uh, been an important part of our business, but it also has been an expense uh, that we 
continue to put money into and uh, uh, I should also mention that we have done some farming with horses and we do continue to do some single horse cultivating which I find to be very effective in particular between uh, steak tomatoes and other uh, taller crops and stuff so we really come at this uh, from a lot of different ways. This past year we purchased a, a front mounted cultivator for the uh, farm all tractor that you see in the background there. I should also mention that um, I have uh, been uh, drawn more to older, uh, t uh, higher profile row cropping tractors. Uh, both of the, the farm all tractors that I have are, are manufactured in the 1960s. They have narrow rubber, 13.6 rubber. You can get narrower rubber if you want. Um, but I'm not the biggest fan of a lot of these compact utility tractors. Uh, as Mike mentioned, the hydrostatic drive is an excellent option and, and uh, that's been something that we've struggled with on this particular tractor in the background here. Um, not being able to uh, dial it down uh, slow enough for what we're trying to do. Um, the thing that I'm, uh, th that I uh, have observed over time is that it is nice to have that extra ground clearance uh, cultivating things like potatoes or uh, sweet corn uh, or brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those things, kale in particular. It's nice to have that extra clearance. So this particular tractor I think has somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 inches of clearance. Um, and uh, that's something that I'm, uh, you know, a big uh, fan of. So back to you, Mike. Thank you, Dan. This is a picture of a plastic mulch layer with the water wheel uh, right behind. One of the things that uh, we needed to do on our farm was uh, take a look at how the land behaved when we were growing vegetables. And we have uh, some slopes and one of the things that was very difficult was to uh, maintain our uh, quality of soil. Uh, and not lose our topsoil to erosion through continual cultivation. And so we did have a G, we did have a farm all A. Unfortunately, we were not able to use them because uh, of our sloping lands. Uh, now, bear in mind, I grew up in uh, land not unlike where many of you are in Iowa. I was from far southwestern Minnesota, and uh, so I was quite accustomed to flat and so when I moved to this farm in Wisconsin it was quite an adjustment but we use a lot of mulching on our farm and we found that we've been able to uh, uh, use this system uh, quite effectively so we lay uh, currently we're using the Biotello biodegradable mulch which is uh, uh, in the process of being certified organic uh, here in the United States uh, we've been using this for a few years we're not a certified organic farm uh, but this is a biodegradable starch product and we're very pleased with how it behaves on our farm. So we use a uh, plastic mulch layer uh, and then we roll out round bales. Uh, and uh, uh, you'll notice that the round bales um, are not all that big. We buy four by fours because that way Patty and I can uh, roll them out. We lay the mulch and then roll out the round bales in between and then we have a complete um, uh, covered uh, soil and this because of our sloping land is something that we've had to go to and we've um, kind of used that notion of Wendell Berry's where you take nature as measure and you know observe what the land is telling you and if we were getting erosion that we just did not like we've gone to this mulching system and uh, uh, that has been a very successful strategy for us. And again, it's just only particular to our farm. Other farms may find it to be a great solution and others may find it to be uh, very, very ineffic inefficient or costly. Uh, so Dan talked about harvesting and harvest efficiencies. Ideally, this is where you're putting all of your time in. Uh, harvesting is where you make your money. So these different carts that Dan has are very efficient at moving uh, produce around. Uh, Dan, I believe that you made these, is that correct? Both of these carts were made by others, but to our specs and stuff. So they fit our harvest totes. They both can carry up to about 300 pounds. The uh, two-wheel aluminum cart on the right is just indispensable. and. Uh, 
I'm I'm sort of struck with uh, uh, somebody that uh, visited our farm years ago and and looked around and said, "Where's your pickup?" And I said, "Well, I, I we don't need one. I I don't really see the point in having one." And um, we uh, partly because the way our fields are laid out, uh, we do uh, the majority of the transporting of the produce with these carts on harvest days, and it's kind of nice not to have motors running and. Uh, uh, we do, uh, however, use wagons and trailers and other things when we start getting into some of the heavier things like winter squash and uh, uh, if we're doing a, a larger harvest of potatoes or cabbage or some of the heavier items. But for the most part, uh, we're, uh, you know, when we talk about tools, uh, the human body is, uh, you know, an essential tool to keep it, uh, keep our bodies healthy, keep us in shape and, uh, I find uh, I'm a real student of s sort of the sort of the wonder of the human body, but also some of the efficiencies of and ergonomics and other things. And uh, so these harvest carts are sort of a uh, variation on that. So um, these are some of the you've probably seen these black baskets, and uh, this is a hand cart that we use here. Mike, if you don't mind, maybe I'll just go through a couple. Go ahead on this one, Mike. Uh, this is just a very simple simple lister plow. This is quite effective at digging furrows. It's nice for, uh, you can dig a furrow for planting potatoes. Uh, the same tool can also be used for lifting potatoes. And they're not very expensive at all. And uh, there's many versions of these that are available at many different uh, farm supply stores. Uh, if you start to grow a few more potatoes, uh, you might find that a potato lifter is helpful. Uh, the one on the left is an old horse drawn. Uh, they're available uh, for maybe four to five hundred dollars. Uh, the version on the right is a PTO driven uh, version so that the chains will uh, rotate uh, um, constantly uh, powered off of your PTO. We currently use one of these uh, diggers on the right and one of the things we like to have a tool do for us is more than one task we're we're somewhat loath to purchase a piece of equipment that'll do just one thing because uh, on a CSA farm you're growing anywhere from 30 to 50 different crops and uh, versatility is really important so with that digger we will use uh, we will dig potatoes uh, garlic um, uh, celeriac leeks uh, we've tried carrots, it didn't work so well, uh, but uh, it certainly works very well with celeriac and uh, leeks and potatoes. Um, you know, my experience relative to the question on mechanical type, uh, excuse me, mechanical uh, lifters and damage on potatoes, we've not had any damage. And in fact, um, uh, if you slow your PTO down, uh, to the extent that your soil is still falling through, your potatoes will come out uh, rather clean and we've not had any significant damage. Like I would say um, zero. And I, uh, let me add something, uh, Mike, there about uh, mechanical potato. Uh, you know, it's important to let the skin set uh, sufficiently on the potatoes. So if you're trying to harvest new potatoes, then you are going to see more uh, scuffing and, and damage to the surface of the potato. Uh, we do have a friend uh, who's been very successful at mitigating that a little bit by putting surgical tubing over the chains. Um, and uh, so that would be one way to, uh, you know, try and adjust for that a little bit. So uh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, the, there's a question about um, the potato digger, Wilsey. Uh, and they're out of uh, Michigan, or excuse me, Ontario. Great folks to work with. Uh, and if you're curious, it's about, uh, I think we paid about $3,000 plus shipping. Um, one of the things that we felt was very, very important uh, is post-harvest handling. Notice that there's at least some shade cover. Uh, that's really important. Um, as many people have said in terms of quality, on your harvested uh, vegetables, quality cannot be added, it can only be preserved. So everything you do either preserves 
or degrades the quality that you start with when it leaves the field. So important items, no matter what scale, are uh, shade, packing containers, bulk tanks, etc. Uh, this is a picture of uh, our walk-in cooler, our root washer for carrots, and also if we're doing bunched carrots, how we wash them using a pressure washer. Um, the root washer, again, it's a tool made by Wilsey, the same company made the digger. What I like about this one is it's a batch style. Uh, it uses recirculating water, and you can do smaller amounts uh, rather than uh, the larger amounts required on some of the um, bigger uh, root washers. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Dan's conveyor belt for his, excuse me, his uh, track conveyor for uh, packing CSA boxes. And uh, uh, Dan has some really remarkable efficiency. So one of the things that we're constantly uh, paying attention to is the amount of double handling. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we try and have things uh, rotating in a counterclockwise fashion where things come in on a lower level. They're pre-washed. They go in uh, th one of three 150-gallon Rubbermaid uh, uh, stock tanks, which are our uh, harvest tubs, um, and then they come down the roller. We use bread trays, the uh, kind of the traditional uh, bakery bread, tr bread trays allow things to drip on the uh, roller. Um, we put things then either right in the boxes and then put the boxes in the cooler uh, or later on in the season we put the item in the cooler and then the morning of we bring things out and put them in the box. But we try and minimize that handling, especially on leafy greens. Um, and uh, this roller conveyor was very inexpensive. We've had it now for 20 years and it's been uh, absolutely indispensable in terms of the efficiency and the success of our, of our handling of produce. This is a, another view this was uh, obviously taken uh, you know in the winter here but the uh, uh, gives you an idea this building is 72 feet long we've got uh, where this uh, farm all tractor is uh, on the on the left here um, this is a uh, kind of a lower area we've got a, a, a loading dock here and uh, our our produce van we're able to bring that around and back that in here and load right into the van with hand carts. And that saves us a tremendous amount of uh, uh, hand handling and hand labor and stuff. Um, so uh, see what else we can continue on with here. We purchased a, a walking forklift here a few years ago. We have gone to some uh, 400 pound capacity uh, field boxes, which we do use for onions when they come in out of the field. Uh, winter squash uh, and other things. I don't have them in the photo here, but this forklift is uh, has been a, a very important thing for us to try and minimize, like I say, double handling uh, some of the equipment here. Um, uh, just a word about our produce van. Uh, we've, we had members help us purchase this van. It's uh, super efficient and uh, we can stand up in the back of the van and it, it uh, does uh, accommodate uh, the 200 and uh, some CSA boxes all at one time. So previously we were making two deliveries a week and then after we got this van we ended up going to one delivery a week and that ended up being uh, a, a very efficient uh, change for us in our uh, uh, business uh, overall. So go ahead Mike, this is your... Uh, this is a, a picture of our CSA delivery day. One of the things that we started with many years ago was a member-based delivery system. And so one of the things we ask of all of our members is that everybody comes out to the farm at least once during the season, either on a Tuesday or on a Saturday to help us wash, pack, and deliver the produce. And there are some inefficiencies about this system. Uh, however, in our opinion, they are far outweighed by uh, the member uh, community building aspect that uh, uh, happens. So every Tuesday there's a group of four to five households that come out. Every Saturday there's another group of four to five and we all collectively uh, uh, get that produce back to uh, the pickup sites. Notice that we're using uh, cloth bags. Uh, 
uh, and that is because as we pack into our members' vehicles, the boxes don't fit particularly well and the bags do. And uh, so a number of years ago, we asked uh, farm members if they would prefer boxes, and as long as we were doing this system of member-based delivery, uh, the folks said overwhelmingly stick with these. So again, it's just developing a system for the particular community that we're a part of. And uh, so one of the things we needed to do is make sure that our system was uh, uh, um, very simple. And we start with the heavy produce, move to the light. And uh, anybody at any time can step in. So we want to make it a very, very seamless type system. Uh, so we don't have a, a delivery vehicle, but we did find it necessary because we had folks out on the farm to put up a community building uh, and this is just a common space where we have uh, a kitchen and a bathroom and this is where farm members gather on Tuesdays and Saturdays during the season when we do our deliveries. So I think uh, Dan unless you have other words uh, at this point um, that's our uh, that's our presentation relative uh, relative to the infrastructure on our farms and we'd be more than happy to answer questions that anybody might have. Thank you guys. That was an excellent presentation and we went over a few minutes of the half an hour for questions, but I think we still have time for quite a few good questions. So if people want to go ahead and put those in the chat box, I'll let um, Mike and uh, Dan have a crack at those. Um, by the way, this is Liz Colby. I'm showing up as Steve Carlson. He's here with me, but you might have been wondering why Steve has such a high voice. And it's because it's Liz. Um, anyway, I'll kick off the question since I don't see any in there yet. And I'm curious for either or both of you, if you purchased any equipment over this time that you immediately wanted to get rid of. And if so, what was it and why? Uh, many, many things. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is if we'll give a piece of equipment about two to three years and then if it's just not working for us uh, we move it on uh, we put it up for sale because we'd rather use that money for uh, something else that is much more advantageous to our system so things I've had uh, several different cultivating tractors as I mentioned they just didn't work I've had uh, transplanters that just didn't work on our system um, those are just a, a couple of the really notable items I guess the one thing that I would add is that uh, some years ago my dad called and he, he noticed a, a, a cube van for sale and he said, oh, I think this would just be great for your business. I'll pay for part of it. And uh, so I was reluctant, but I ended up sort of going ahead and purchasing it and we never really incorporated into our business and ended up uh, selling it or bartering, uh, bartering it for something else a few years later. So that would just be one example uh, of something that didn't work out for us. It was just too large for the scale that we were on. Well, All right, let's turn to the chat box now. Looks here. like there's some questions um, starting to roll in. We don't weigh our boxes, but uh, I would say the hallmark to a successful CSA is variety. Um, it, it, too much is is definitely a problem for people, but if you tend to have a nice uh, array of herbs and greens, and uh, if you're very mindful about uh, sort of varying tastes that your members have, uh, not overwhelming them with any one item, uh, the temptation is to is to fill a box completely full. But uh, we'd rather see lots of color and lots of variety. Uh, we do a lot of that, as I said, with the herbs and the greens and and. Uh, colored peppers and, and other things. Um, I should also mention that uh, we also have two hay grove tunnels. We've got about 11,000 square feet of high tunnels. We grow cherry tomatoes and tomatillos and a number of other things in there, which just add a lot of variety uh, to the boxes. So, I see David's question. Uh, composting. Our, our composting system uh, needs improvement. Uh, it is some, it is just a long windrow of composted material, uh, fresh green matter mixed with hay and turned uh, rather sporadically. Uh, it's something that definitely needs improvement. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and, and take on Patrick's question as well. Um, 
so we have you we use cover crops to the extent that we use them for soil building and we keep our uh, our beds very uh, narrow we'll do like three or four or five beds and then there'll be a cover crop strip etc we have also uh, experimented with rolled down uh, rye uh, we had a roller crimper that we tried and uh, Given how far north we were are in Wisconsin, it just didn't work that well for us. One year we had great to pumpkins using the rolled down rye cover crop system, uh, and the next year we did not. It was just too cool. Uh, that's been our experience with it. Uh, it did, however, um, totally eliminate any erosion that uh, one might experience, uh, and so for that I liked it. But uh, a crop one year and not the next. So we've gone back to just using purchased hay. I'll just add in terms of cover cropping that, it, you know, back to my earlier comment about climate change and some of the variability in the weather that cover crops are something in particular that uh, we're finding that one size does not fit all and we have to be sort of adapting and thinking on our feet. Uh, a couple examples there, we used to grow a lot of winter rye. We'd have four or five acres uh, at any given uh, fall and then uh, uh, when we would get the periodic dry spring uh, the rye with its extensive root system would take so much moisture out of the soil that it would take a substantial amount of rain to reconstitute uh, the capillarity in the soil and um, uh, likewise with rye if you have a wet cool season it can be difficult to uh, break it down uh, it ends up souring and, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've made the transition to more winter killed cover crops, but cover cropping is a very important part of market gardening. It's something all of us, uh, certainly have a lot more to learn and, uh, I think can be, uh, supporting and helping each other out with more information. Uh, this is answering the question about uh, the Wilsey digger for onions. Um, and uh, just a little clarification, um, Dick, relative to that. Um, are you thinking of storing uh, onions, fresh onions, for two to three weeks? Or are you looking at uh, um, fall storage type onions? My concern about uh, fresh onions is that I'm afraid the uh, digger would uh, bruise them. That's uh, they are awfully tender. Um, and just by the way, we don't use the digger for our uh, onions. We just pull them by hand and make a windrow in the field, and then pick them up uh, at uh, a later date uh, when the tops have dried down. I'll answer the next question then about livestock. Um, we've tried a number of things and I, I think uh, this right, you know, finding the right balance on a market garden is a tricky thing. Uh, it's it's uh, tempting to, uh, to add, uh, uh, you know, a, a mix of livestock which does not necessarily blend very well with the demands of, of vegetable farming. Um, as I mentioned, we've done some farming with draft horses. We're currently sort of, uh, uh, contracting that a little bit. We still have three horses and do use them a little bit uh, more for firewood uh, harvesting and hauling. Um, uh, I would say, uh, you know, being uh, really keeping balance in mind, uh, fencing. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a Gene Logsdon quote, which I really like, and that is that the uh, primary, uh, the, the most important uh, capital expenditure on any farm should be fencing, uh, regardless of the cropping uh, sequence. And uh, it, it is pretty intriguing to think that we could be using animals for tillage and a lot more things. But then I do know that uh, in our case, uh, we dedicate a tremendous amount of labor to managing, uh, I won't say tremendous amount, but we do end up having to shift labor to uh, these other needs on the farm and sometimes that doesn't always uh, make a lot of sense when there are uh, demands in the garden. Uh, we do have honeybees uh, that are uh, owned and managed by someone else so there are a lot of other uh, uh, you know, methods for uh, 
uh, having some diversity on your farm uh, that complements the business without having the responsibility and the work for them. I'm going to echo Dan on the livestock. Uh, we've had over the years uh, cattle, hogs, sheep, chickens, uh, turkeys, ducks. Uh, we still have honeybees and uh, but we set aside some of the livestock. It was just really tough to balance out uh, growing fresh vegetables and also trying to uh, manage livestock at the same time. Uh, on a small scale, we just found that the uh, labor allocation uh, just didn't work very well and we weren't making any money on it. I do believe uh, animals have a, a very important role on a small scale farm. Uh, we've just not been able to make the uh, calculator work in our favor in that regard yet. Well, and just to wrap up on livestock, economies of scale come into play very quickly and if you're not uh, producing uh, all of the feed grains uh, necessary to, to raise and, and market those uh, uh, livestock, then you're uh, ending up creating a drain potentially, uh, which then ends up being subsidized by the vegetables. Um, okay, the, there's a uh, question here from Dennis uh, about uh, how do we, uh, what is our rotational planting uh, method? And that's a fairly complex uh, question uh, for the time we have remaining, but I'll say that we try and keep families together. We try and not have uh, 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 families on top of each other from year to year. Um, I used to believe that a one-to-one -one ratio between cover cropping and vegetables uh, was sort of an ideal. The longer I f farm, the more I realize that that ratio probably needs to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about one to four. Um, uh, one acre of annual uh, produce to about four acres of cover crops uh, in order to really do effective soil building. Although we had a soil workshop here at our farm a month ago, which Mike uh, also attended, and uh, one of our fellow CSA farmers who does have a one to four ratio said that uh, although he's uh, benefiting from the uh, longer rotation, he's not able to bring weeds under control because he has to, to do so much more weed control over uh, these additional acres and that it's actually been a detriment to, to his particular farm. So um, uh, just a few thoughts there. Our, our planting tends to be in 50 foot wide increments. We plant uh, onions in blocks, peppers in blocks, the cabbage family in blocks so that culturally you're, when you're cultivating and when you're irrigating, uh, you have things uh, somewhat isolated uh, so that you're not uh, uh, it, it that creates a efficiency with your time and stuff. So um, I'll take a stab at the next one here from Patrick. Shed some light on searching for land. Um, you know, how do you find your land? Uh, uh, the thing that we found in our search for land is that uh, very little farmland uh, is ever sold through a realtor or um, it's more common to be sold at an auction. But that, uh, you know, what we tended to do was to uh, we had an old time farmer who talked to his uh, friends and neighbors at the coffee shop and at the cafe in town and uh, a couple of those uh, farmers invited us over to have conversations and uh, in our experience most land tends to uh, transfer from uh, with a handshake and with people uh, earning each other's trust and um, we were very fortunate to uh, have an older farmer uh, kind of work on our behalf and uh, so uh, unfortunately uh, land prices are uh, difficult right now uh, kind of following they should soften here a little bit with uh, corn prices being lower and commodity uh, prices softening uh, a little bit so uh, go ahead Mike. Uh, in regard to Dick's question about flame weeding um, We've tried flame weeding off and on over the years and uh, it can be very effective but on our particular case our primary weed uh, issue today is purslane and purslane does not respond well to flame weeding and so uh, we really don't use it too much. And so flame weeding uh, for us would be most effective on the direct seeded crops such as carrots, parsnips, etc and uh, purslane is our primary weed in there so sometimes these tools are <clears throat> excuse me are very good but in our case um, they just don't work for our particular need uh, if I need to do any flaming or I think it's beneficial I just use a hand torch 
uh, with a, a LP tank. And I would echo that. Uh, we we did try some some flame weeding. Uh, one of the problematic re uh, weeds that many uh, vegetable farmers have to deal with are the, they're the, 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 the warm season grasses which germinate late and the crown tends to be somewhat protected uh, below the soil surface um, and uh, it works fine on broad leaves at a, at a very uh, uh, specific time but really uh, in our experience was fairly ineffective on uh, the grasses. Um, I should just mention that this past year we tried something for the first time that was uh, fairly successful. Uh, it was something that a neighbor uh, introduced us to. Uh, we seeded our carrots and then we stretched uh, black woven landscape fabric over the rows. Uh, we irrigated on top of that. Uh, after five days you pull the landscape fabric back and you see all of these really tender white uh, weeds that ha are, are, are growing looking for light and you pull that landscape fabric off and uh, on a sunny afternoon the the weeds are uh, uh, you know uh, so uh, spindly and uh, uh, unable to withstand the intensity of the sun that they die out the carrots germinate a day or two later and uh, for the first time um, we uh, did not have to uh, hand weed our fall carrots this year uh, although we did have to on our spring carrots but Weather is certainly a factor there. So um, I'm back to your flame weeding. I would say that uh, I know many farmers that have tried it. I know very few that have stayed with it. And so that's something I certainly wouldn't wouldn't spend a lot of uh, I wouldn't make it a very high priority in terms of capitalizing uh, for that uh, for that reason. Jenny, do you want to finish typing your question in there? Oh, guess not. <laughs> well, uh, we're about out of time. Does anyone have any last questions? Do we get an opportunity just to have some closing comments here? Yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah I'll just go ahead this is uh, Absolutely, yeah. I, I just want to thank ahead. everyone I'll for uh, participating tonight. Thanks. This is like I said kind of a new experience for us and uh, I, I, uh, I'm available if folks want to send me an email and I uh, do my best to uh, share further experiences and talk through any purchases or any decisions that you're trying to make uh, within reason certainly but uh, that's something that Mike and I have both uh, taken very seriously um, remembering people that helped us along the way and uh, really seeing ourselves as being part of this wider community of support um, in, in order to uh, help everyone be successful. So just thank you very much and uh, good luck with uh, your decision making for the coming season. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to Practical Farmers of Iowa and all the participants. Uh, Mike? This was a very uh, a, a very fun and, and interesting experience. So thank you very much. It's always very humbling to be with a group of uh, folks who are very engaged and uh, great questions. So thank you once again. And like Dan said, more than happy to answer any questions that I uh, can. Best way to contact me is email and uh, just go to Spring Hill Community Farm and you'll find a contact uh, page there. You guys could uh, type your email addresses Great into the idea. chat box. Great idea. I'll that do that right now. Easier, or your website into the chat box. That might be easier for everyone to get there quickly. All right. And I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight for this farm hour. It'll be archived on the Practical Farmers of Iowa website, so you can search for it there. Um, and you can fast forward to the parts that I talk, which everyone I'm sure likes to do. And next week we have another farm and hour about CSAs and it's customer retention for CSAs and we have uh, Ben Saunders um, and uh, Pat Mulvey and she's a chef and he is a farmer and they're going to talk about some different perspectives on what they see and how you can make your box and your planning better for, for keeping your members year after year. So with that, have a good evening everyone and good night.